Hey, why don't you get hold of your Bible and head with me over to Psalm 90, uh, over to Psalm 90, and uh, let me just pray. Father, I pray as we study your word right now that uh, it would be a food uh, for our souls, that it would grow our faith. We have so much to be thankful for. We thank you for your faithfulness to our church. We thank you for the work that you are doing in us and through all of us. We thank you, uh, God, for the things that we're still praying about in advance by faith. We thank you for the things that you are yet to do. And we pray right now that this time in your word would advance your purposes for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Um, how about a little trivia? A little trivia? Everybody for a little trivia? You know, I got a question for you. Here's the question. Can you take it? Can you handle it? Here it is. Name a top 100 hymn based upon Psalm 90. Come on. Name it. Boop, 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 um, incorrect, incorrect, <laughs> amazing grace. But, but, but that is the number that our son Luke, the head of the worship department gave, and it was wrong when he said it too. <laughs> so you're in good, you're in good company. Anyone else? A hymn based on Psalm 90. Come on. Great is thy faithfulness. Love you, Cindy. Incorrect. <laughs> Rock of Ages. Also incorrect. Poorly done. Here's the answer. Here's, here, <laughs> here's the answer. Now, that actually served two purposes there. It, uh, it uh, um, reminded us, gave us the song, uh, based, the hymn based on Psalm 90, and reminded us why we don't sing like that at harvest. <laughs> so, so, calm down, send all your letters to Pastor Rick. And, 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 and uh, so here's some of the great uh, words to this uh, hymn uh, based on Psalm 90. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. See that right out of verse 1? You have been our dwelling place in all generations. And then the hymn says, Before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame from everlasting. See that right out of the scriptures? Uh, Thou art God to endless years the same. A thousand ages in your sight are like an evening gone, short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. And then the closing stanza to this, uh, number 58 in the top 100 hymns. Um, o God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our guide while troubles last and our eternal home. Well, this is the uh, concluding uh, message in uh, our uh, series, um, The God of Here and Now, uh, and Getting on God's Time Signature. And I hope to finish the message today, but let's just review quickly where we've been at the end of summer here with people in and out. Uh, first of all, the eternality of God from verses 1 and 2. Um, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting you are God. And that's the message of God's eternality. That God uh, doesn't experience time the way that we do. That God stands outside of time. That God uh, takes in uh, the entirety uh, of, of all of eternity uh, in every moment, that he's not experiencing a sequence of time the way that we are, uh, that he is infinite, that he is outside of time, and because he is infinite, uh, he can be with us, uh, all of us, think of all of us on the Rolling Meadows campus, all of us here in Elgin, all of us on all of our seven campuses across Chicagoland, and not just that, but, but uh, seven other churches and 700 and 7,000 and 700,000, that God is with all of his people individually and corporately at every moment, including right, say it, right now, the God of here and now. 
And then you contrast that truth of God's eternality with our brevity. That, that while he is eternal, uh, we are temporal. Uh, verse 3 says, you return man to dust and say, return, O children of men. A thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past or as a watch in the night. In regard to our brevity, verse 5, you sweep them away as with a flood. They're like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. And in the evening it fades and withers for we are Brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath. We are dismayed. That's a big theme here. God's wrath His, We called God's wrath the holy furnace of vengeful intent. Which ensures God's justice will be satisfied. Wow. You've set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. There it is again. We bring our years to end to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Remember that. Uh, yet their uh, span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. So there you have it. Uh, God is eternal. I am temporal. And then uh, what should I do about it? And last week we started in this two-part conclusion called the clarity of what? And the first thing we should do in view of God's eternality and our temporalness is we should uh, know God deeply. Verse 11, including things that are not easy to know about God, like his wrath. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? And that is a great reality for everyone who lives their life and consumes their days outside of Christ. All they have to look forward to is God's wrath. But for those of us who have by his grace turned from our sin and embraced Christ by faith, we can look forward to his mercy and his forgiveness and an eternity in heaven with him. Yet we still are committed to, see it in verse 12, counting our days carefully. So teach us to number our days. How's that going? Numbering your days. How's that going? Uh, the, 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 the less you have, uh, the more you realize you need to count them carefully, measure them out slowly, enjoy each one. And uh, so, you know, uh, teach us to num numbering our days can mean a lot of things. But whatever it means, it most surely means uh, sit up and pay attention to this message. It for sure means that. And it for sure means to count each of your days. They all matter, right? Every one of our days matters. Every one of them, one by one, we're measuring them out. And, and uh, so I started doing some math on this. If it means anything, it has to mean counting them. So count your days right now. Look at the text. Verse 10 says that you have... Um, you know, 70 years, if by reason of strength, 80. How's that going for you? How's the 80 going? And uh, there, was a guy in the, there was a guy in the first service who didn't, wasn't thrilled with my formula, because here's the formula. I'm about to teach math right now, which if you know anything about my math skills, this is audacious what I'm about to try to do here. <laughs> but I'm going to uh, try to uh, give you a little math formula. Here it is. So 70, if, if you live a full life, you'll live 70 as a full life. By, if you're super strong, 80 is a super full life. So let's kind of cut that in the middle. We'll call it 75. Here we're doing it. We're counting our days. So 75 minus my age times 365. That's how many you can expect that you have left. How many do you have left? Guy over here in the first service yells out, I'm dead. And, and he's such a godly guy, I love him. And I just said, you know, so he he's knows, he's on grace. He's on grace right now. And, and so I kind of did the math for me. 75 minus my age times 365, I have, if I get to live a full life, and I can't even expect that. But um, if I do get to live a full life, I have 7,665 days left. I kind of tried to really nail it down. So if I have 7,665 days left, then uh, um, looking back that many days, that's when President, how many people remember when Bill Clinton became president? Remember George Sr. lost the election. Bill Clinton, I wonder what this is going to be all about. And, and I can remember so clearly when he became president, that's only how many days I have uh, left. And now whether you have more days than that or how many people have more days than me left based on that formula? Put up your hand if you got more than me. All right, put up your hand if you got the same as me approximately or less than me. Come on, no, no. <laughs> all right, all right. So if you do the math on that, and you sh she'll tell you when you get home. Don't worry about it. And, and she'll, she'll figure it out for you. And, and uh, here's the thing. 
should have a number. Numbering your days means certainly weighing them, measuring them, valuing them. But before it can mean any of that, it for sure means counting them. So do the math and get a number and consider yourself blessed for however many days you have left. Count them carefully and make every single one of them count. If God is eternal and I'm just here for a few minutes, just for a moment, I got some big clarity now. I'm going to know God deeply. I'm going to count my days carefully. Here's the third thing, and this will be the end of our review, and then um, grow in wisdom. Last week, I stood up here pretty, it uh, wasn't easy. It was not easy, I'll be honest. It was not easy um, to talk about five uh, important things that I feel like God's been teaching me. Wisdom that I didn't have that I have now. Um, priorities that I didn't have that I have now. Things that I didn't see clearly that I see clearly now and want to be accountable for. But the point in sharing my list was not just simply to let you know what God's doing in my life in the last five years, but also to say to you, you should have a list too. If you're numbering your days, if you're getting a heart of wisdom, you should be able to write down, these are some things that God has shown me. This is some wisdom that God has given me. These are some things that God has changed about me. Do you have a list? Did you make a list this week? If you didn't, do it. And write down some, because some guy came up to me afterwards and said, you said you had some more on the list. I said, dude, get your own list. Stop worrying about what my list is. Get your own list. Have some specific things that God has taught you. He has shown you some wisdom you have gained, some ways that you're living in light of the days that you've experienced and the days, the fleeting number of days that are still ahead. All right, so now into some new material and on into the end of the passage, God willing, during this message. Look at verse 14. What a thing to pray. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Start with that first word, that word satisfy. Does that surprise you that we can pray that? Did you know that God wants to satisfy you? Did you know that? God wants you to be satisfied. All right? The problem isn't that God wants us to be satisfied. The problem is, is that we're satisfied with so little and so easily and wrong things that don't satisfy at all. One of the characteristics of adolescence is, is adolescence, once they get, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they start thinking that they know, listen up, students, they start thinking that they know what will satisfy them. And they start thinking to themselves, well, the worst thing, the worst thing in my life is all these rules. And, and I'll be a lot happier when I don't have my mom and dad's rules. And, and, you know, while we're at it, let's get rid of God's rules, too. And they think, I'm going to be more happy if I could just get out there and have some freedom. Now, parents, am I telling the truth? Is that the way they think? They start to think that way. And, and, and so they have to go out, uh, some of them sadly more than others. And they have to learn that, that a freedom is not what it promises. And freedom, far from bringing me joy and satisfaction, actually brings to me, uh, you know, a lot of times real heartache. And that freedom is not found in coloring outside the lines. Freedom is not found in getting free from restraint. If you think that God somehow has established rules in his word and through your parents that are keeping you from happiness, you could not be more wrong. And students, you're sitting in a room full of people that learned in high school and learned in college and learned in early adulthood what I say here so often, that God's rules are not to restrict our happiness, but to guarantee it. And when God says don't, tell me what he really means is don't hurt yourself. When God says don't, he means don't hurt yourself. And, and choose to sin, tell me. Choose to suffer, right? And that's really the way it really is. And, and listen, listen, listen. God doesn't think your desires are too strong. And God thinks that our desires are too weak, that we are satisfied with, with too little. Honestly, uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Weight of Glory, uh, said this amazing thing. Listen to this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, Lewis said, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition. 
when infinite joy is offered us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So what an awesome prayer to pray. I challenge you to pray this prayer every morning this week. So uh, satisfy us, verse 14, Psalm 90, 14, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Some uh, people uh, think that the word morning there means morning as at the end of a season of trial, uh, as it says, for example, in Psalm uh, 30, uh, verse 5, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. However, I would suggest to you that this usage of M-O-R-N-I-N-G, this usage of morning, it's not referring to the time after a long night of trials, but is actually referring, as the whole psalm has been, to every single day. And I want to challenge you to pray the prayer in Psalm 90, 14. I promise you I will do this this week. I promise you I'll do this this week, and I challenge you to do the same thing. I'm going to have my Bible on my nightstand, and every morning when I wake up, I'm going to pull my Bible off my nightstand. I'm going to open it on my chest to Psalm 90, 14, and I'm going to pray this prayer before my feet hit the floor. I'm going to pray this, God, today, satisfy me in the morning with, see that there, your steadfast love. That word is one of the most important words in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word is the word hesed, but actually the way that they pronounce it, we don't have this consonant sound in our language, but it's kind of fun to say. It sounds like you're clearing your throat. It's hesed, hesed. I say that. Come on, do it. That was gross. Do it again. (laughs) Come on, come on, everybody. Come on. Chesed, say it. And when you wake up in the morning this week, I want you to pray this prayer. Pull your Bible off your nightstand. Open to Psalm 90, 14 and say, God, satisfy me today with your chesed, with your steadfast love. That uh, term there, steadfast love, is describing a love that that just is, is, is nearly impossible to find in this world. It, It means God's covenant love. It's the idea, look up here for a second. Let me just make some eye contact with you. It's this idea that God loves you with a covenant love. Listen, listen, that his eyes are always upon you, that you're never out of his thoughts, that he is constantly working every circumstance. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus by by placing your faith personally in him, if you are one of his blood-bought sons and daughters, then you are never out of God's care. You are never out of his love. He is always tracking, ordering the circumstances of your life to teach you, to train you, to shape you, to bless you, to give to you great things in your future. That's going on right now if you are part of his family. And listen, you didn't earn it. We don't earn God's covenant love. So because we don't earn it, and because we don't deserve it, we also can't do anything to forfeit it. He has never loved you more when you've done something right. He has never loved you less when you've done something wrong. You are always under his steadfast love. That's your identity. That's who you really are. You're not who your job performance says you are. You're not who your past says you are. You're not who your parents say you are. You're not who your problems say you are. You are who God says you are because he has set his covenant love upon you. Now that's just not the way that people love. People love in a kind of a contract love kind of way. Contract love is, I love what you do for me. Um, I, I love how you make me feel. When you don't do for me anymore, when you don't make me feel this way anymore, I don't love anymore. I fell in love, I fell out of love. Fell, falling in love is one of the worst phrases in the human uh, existence. A biblical love is volitional love, a decision to put someone ahead of myself. Not this contract love. I love you because you love me. I love you because I have, because of my illusion, I have some thoughts about you. And when I find out that you're not who I thought you were, I don't love anymore. I love my illusion of you. I love you because it's working and when it's not working anymore I don't love anymore that's contract love and when it dissipates and disintegrates it's devastating and I'm not talking about that at all when I'm talking about God's love covenant love I will always love you 
That's God. A, a contract requires two people. It's a deal. I'll do my part if you do your part. Sign here. God doesn't love us with contract love. God loves us with covenant love. It only requires one person to keep it. God who has made a covenant with himself to love his people in a certain way. I will always love you. I choose to love you. I know you perfectly and I love you anyway. I need nothing from you. I love you and I love to give to you. Nothing you ever do will ever change that. That is my love for you. And so what a wonderful thing to pray this week, every day this week. I'm going to do it. I want you to do it too. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. Why? That we may rejoice and be glad all our days. See, this third thing is this contentment. I'm pursuing contentment. Okay? Know God deeply. Count days carefully. Grow in wisdom. Pursue contentment. I don't need anything else. I have what I need. I have God's love. That is my defining reality. God loves me. Nothing can change it. Everything else is going to revolve around that unchanging center. Now, I, don't, I know we don't all know each other super personally, but I try to you know, make myself known to you as I preach because we're kind of in this living for the Lord thing together. And uh, how many people are, are um, surprised to know um, that I'm kind of sentimental? You surprised that I am actually pretty sentimental about things, and and uh, so I really I'm not a huge fan of Facebook. I know a lot of people are really into that. I'm kind of okay with with uh, Twitter. That's a way to send out messages. But you know what I really like? I really like this Instagram thing, because on how many people are doing that Instagram thing? Because on Instagram you can actually follow a person and see what they're doing, and just it's like without all the nonsense. It's like there it is, and I just follow these people in my life that I'm close to and whatever. And so I, they got this thing on Instagram now called Throwback Thursdays. They call it hashtag TBT, and you put up some like old picture of yourself. So I've been looking at some old pictures, and uh, it's actually really great to go back and look at old pictures. I, it reminds me of what really matters. I found this a picture this week. I'm going to probably put that out on Instagram here this week. That is a picture of my mom uh, with our firstborn grandson Carter. She really only ever got to be with him once or twice, and and. Uh, Boy, that is really dear to me, that picture of my mom holding her great, her first great grandson. And then I found this picture that's going to make you laugh. Uh, that, is, that is a picture of me and Kathy when big glasses were in style, before small ones were, before big ones were again, before small ones were again. That's Kathy and I, I think on our 10th anniversary, we went uh, sailing downtown Chicago and, uh, and I look at those pictures and I think to myself, you know, how much time and energy is given to things that aren't going to matter much or not for very long and what really is at the center? I mean the very center. So I go through all of this and scope down to this and eventually you get to, to family and, and, and you get to the center of that. And at the center of it all, of course, is the Lord. And I got thinking this week as I was praying about all of this. And satisfy me in the morning with your steadfast love. Nothing else matters, Lord, but that reality. And I started singing over and over in my mind this new Vertical Church Band song. I think you'll recognize the chorus. If I have you, nothing else. I have everything. And, and to center my life down on that, you know, to get on that as my only thing. You know, the subtitle of this uh, sermon uh, is actually, uh, the, I haven't mentioned it until now, but I'm sure you'll see why I said this. Uh, the God of here and now getting on God's time signature. And, and, and you know what time signatures are? How many people know what a time signature is? And if you, if you didn't study music very much, you might not know that there's a variety of these time signatures. Uh, here's what a 4-4 four, four, uh, looks like. And there's the treble clef. And then so that's, and then 3-4, that's how the time is measured out. And then kind of a crazier one would be like 6-8. There's several of these time signatures. And the time signature measures out the meter of the music. 
I thought that was such a great picture. When I remember when I was, this is so long ago now, but when I was in Bible college, um, um, they used to, I had to take a class. Remember this? If you ever went to old school church, I had to take a class on how to lead singing. Remember this guy that used to be up at the front and he's going like this. I never knew, well, what's that guy doing? And he's up there and he's waving his hands. So he's waving his hands to the time signature to lead the people in. And then there's more complicated ones. And we had to learn all these time signatures in school. And, and I, I'm, I'm, if you were that guy, I don't want to offend you. I, I don't miss that guy at all. I praise God that we don't have that. But the concept is super important. And just like music has a time signature, the God who loves you, the God who made you has a time signature and he exists outside of time and you exist inside of time for a very brief time and, and by the way that's not, a, like, that's not a great fun thing to come to church you know like, oh I can't wait to get over to harvest again Pastor James is going to remind us how soon we're going to die <laughs> love that church <laughs> you know um, but it's truth that sets you free, brothers and sisters. And we all want to live our life and, 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 and act like and put off the reality that is racing toward us. And God wants us to realize that while he is eternal in his time signature, we are not. And he wants us to know we are not everlasting. Only he is. That's why we worship him. And we are temporal and life is measured and we're to be counting our days, knowing God deeply, counting days carefully, growing in wisdom, pursuing contentment. I challenge you to pray the prayer of verse 14 every day this week. And then this, just two more. Verse 15, um, optimize suffering. Optimize suffering. See it there in verse 15? Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us. And for as many years as we have seen evil. It's, it's like he's asking God to take the time of his life and put it on the balance scale. And maybe you feel like this. You know, God, we, you've let us go through some pretty hard things. We've had a lot of tears. We've had some long nights, God. It hadn't been easy all the time. And could you just kind of do, you know, just could we have a little reckoning here? Could we kind of add up the number of difficult days that we've done? And could you give us, God, kind of a, some, some good days, some, some, some joyful days, some glad days? Surely all of our days aren't supposed to be difficult days. But I don't, I don't think he's just saying balance it out I actually think he's saying more than that look at it again make us glad for or actually it could be as a result of the many days that you have afflicted us for as many day, years as we've seen evil you know God I wasted a lot of years and you, you had to do a lot in my life to get my attention and to, to get me on your program and you, you've let me go through a lot, God. And I, I want, this is it, this is it. I want the result of it, God. I want the outcome. Could I just remind you that not everyone who goes through affliction gets the benefit? How many pe people could be honest and raise your hand if you can honestly say, sometimes God's had to put me through something again because I didn't learn it the first time. Who's that? Hold your hand up high. I think I, right, right? I think I had to go through the same thing again or something similar because I didn't get it the first time. And I always think to myself, well, if I have to go through that again, at least I want it to be to learn something different. And Hebrews chapter 12, I think it's verse 11, says, get this, no trial seems, this is going to be a great spot for an amen, no trial seems joyful for the moment. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields like the cornfields that are ripe now and ready for harvest. Trials yield, here it is, the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So apparently there's two categories of God's people going through affliction. There's two categories. Which one are you in? The people who are trained by it and the people who are 
not trained by it. And they go through it and they white knuckle and they hang on, they get through somehow and it passes, but it comes right around again because they weren't trained by it. And I think what he's getting at here is, is hear this, trials properly experienced expand your capacity to experience grace, to be blessed, to be ministered to, to experience joy. Another way to say it would be this. Those who have suffered little can scarcely rejoice for the capacity to delight is forged in the furnace of affliction. Now you know that's true. Because you know people who seem like they've hardly gone through anything. They're always whining and complaining about everything. And they're not grateful for anything. But sometimes the people who are the most joyful and the most thankful, even for the little things of life, are the people who have endured much. Just thankful to be here. Just thankful to be alive. Just thankful to have my health and strength. Just thankful to be in the sunshine today. Just thankful to have people around me. Just thankful to be part of this church. Just, just so thankful for things that we take for granted. And I went through some things. And because I've gone through some things now, God has grown my capacity to be, to be grateful for what I have. With that in mind, let me read the verse a final time. Make us glad... For as many days as you have afflicted us, let our joy be in proportion to what you've allowed us to go through. And it will be so. I want to tell you about a a couple that's very dear to me who I think are living this. Um, This is a picture of uh, Robert and Bobby Walgamuth. Uh, Robert's father was a very, very dear mentor to me, a confidant of Billy Graham who poured into Kathy and Ihina's Wife Grace, Sam and Grace Walgamuth meant a lot to us in our early years of ministry. And this is his son, Robert, and Robert's wife, Bobby. I don't mention him at church. I don't know if I ever have. But behind the scenes, uh, Robert actually is a literary agent. And he uh, represents some of the most well-known Christian authors uh, in America that bless you, people you love to read, people you learn from. And I don't think he would even be working with me if I hadn't known his father but um, he's a very, very dear man and has been to our church many, 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 many times. And uh, I'm super thankful for him. And was, Kathy and I were heartbroken to get the news on Valentine's Day 2012 uh, that his wife, Bobby, who honestly is one of the most effervescent, energetic, contagious, Christ-loving, Christ-following Christians you would ever meet. I mean, this lady's capacity to delight in the simple things of life, her contentment and her joy in the Lord, is, it's, just, it's just mind-boggling. And she would be the best example of this thing that I'm talking about now from verse 15, optimizing suffering. Okay, the clarity of what? Know God deeply, count days carefully, grow in wisdom, pursue contentment, and optimize suffering. You know what that word optimize means? Okay, how many people know the word optimize? It's actually a pretty great word because the word optimize is actually doing itself. Optimize means to make the most of an opportunity. To get the most from an opportunity, to optimize it, to get out of it the the greatest amount. So the word optimize is actually optimizing words and it takes five or six words to get the most out of something and it condenses it down to one word, optimize. And as Christians, do you, do you consider yourself a Christian? You, are you a Christian? You, you follow, okay, so am I talking to the right group? Christians want to optimize suffering. They want to get the greatest amount out of it. And when uh, Bobby found out that she had uh, stage four terminal, really, apart from a miracle, a uh, cancer uh, back early in 2012, I mean, what she went about to do, we get their emails email updates um, every uh, 10 days or two weeks, I think approximately, and these have been coming. And I mean, it's just unbelievable, these people going to the cancer ward, going for the surgery, going for the um, tests, going for the treatments back and forth, sick, hair loss, sick, hair grow back, sick again, sick, you know, test results going up, filled with faith, praying, 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 trusting God, test results going down up. And some of you have been through this. I mean, the, the, it is an awful thing, but, but um, you know, These people have used it so, so much to honor the Lord. So this Wednesday night when Kathy and I were driving into Rolling Meadows, I got this email and and, uh, 
you know, it's just super hard to hear, and, and we love these people so much. Um, Robert wrote uh, with the news about his wife last Thursday on our visit to the doctor, um, and again, uh, early on Monday morning, a second visit to the doctor, we determined that no more treatment of any kind will be necessary. This has happened very quickly, and Bobby received the news with grace. Then a few hours later, a very kind hospice administrator walked us through the necessary steps for the next few months. Then at the end of the afternoon, Bobby said goodbye to the doctors and nurses who have loved and served her so well, so faithfully. He says, as I drove home, I remembered a time, a watershed moment early in my life. He had been with some friends out in San Francisco, and he was starting out on a, on a bicycle trip 4,000 miles from coast to coast. And about 100 miles out of San Francisco, he realized what he had signed up for. And he says, the Lord gave him this verse, which has been such a constant companion to them. The Lord, Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Who knew that since Valentine's Day 2012, when we first received Bobby's stage four cancer diagnosis and the specter of another coast-to-coast -coast voyage, that this truth would be just what Bobby would need. God knew. Bobby is still praising him. Jesus has been her stronghold. He has been her reason to grip things gently and love people deeply, to do her best, to design her life so painful though it will be to say goodbye, she can leave. And then he quotes the hymn, Like a River Glorious. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. Those who trust him wholly, find him wholly true. Love to you and Kathy, he says. So I thought, well, I just got to tell our people about this. I mean, here's a godly family who are optimizing their suffering. I said to him, I texted him, I said, can I just tell her? Because I would never do that without permission. And he texts me back. He said, he said, that would be wonderful. Here's why he wanted me uh, to tell you. He said, it'd be wonderful. He said, even though we've prayed for her healing all these months, we have gratefully submitted to God's will for her. However, and this is a big however, we have prayed for the salvation of folks who have come in contact with Bobby. People that Bobby would never have met if she hadn't been struck with late stage cancer. He said, this has happened. The clinic has been her mission field. And she has seen her diagnosis as a visa to visit a foreign land. Three weeks ago, for example, a Jewish woman knelt at our couch at the clinic and received Jesus as her longed-for Messiah. Salvation of the lost is always God's will. From the beginning, Bobby has said that if one person comes to faith through this, it will be completely worth it. And then he writes, serving a person like Bobby to the end is my privilege. One more thought, he adds. Bobby was testifying publicly about the Lord's grace in her life a few months ago, and she said this great sentence. The only cure for cancer is the gospel. That's awesome. You know, that in the end of all this little short life, and she left early, and he stayed late, and she, was, she went right on time, and, and who's going to remember that in a thousand years? And all that's going to matter is that you optimized your opportunity and suffered well in what God allowed and expanded your capacity to rejoice in the things that God has blessed you with. Wow. And then this. Last point. Optimize suffering and extend legacy. Extend legacy. You'll see why I'm saying that when you look at verse 16. Do you see it? Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Whose children? The servants' children. Let your work be shown to, their, to, to your servants and your glorious power to their children. That's it, isn't it? Isn't that what we want? You know, let me tell you what God did in, in 1990, whatever. Let me tell you what God did. Not here. Thank God for all the things that he's done. But if all of the things that he has done isn't preparation for what's ahead, it is preparation for what's ahead. And our best days are still ahead of us. And it's, it's just so, so important that we... Hey, I was watching this documentary this week. Did you... Um, 
what's the name of that guy that, um, that's really fast? Gold medal, Jamaica runner. What's his name? Usain Bolt, right. Is it troubling to you that I watched the documentary, but I had to ask you what the guy's name was? <laughs> the part about it that I really liked was, he, you know, he runs the 100 and gets a gold medal, runs the 200. This guy's super fast, right? Like just crazy, gifted, and hardworking. And, and, but the thing about Usain Bolt that's super cool is he didn't just win those individual races. I think my favorite thing is he got with the other guys in Jamaica, and he won this thing called the 4x100 relay. Set a world record. And, and I, I, I ran this a little bit when I was in high school, and I remember them telling you, it doesn't matter how fast you are. It does not matter how fast you are. If you don't pass that baton, clearly, if that thing gets dropped, it won't matter. You could be the fastest people in the face of the earth. You will lose the race if you fail to pass cleanly. And, and I don't think anymore, honestly, about accomplishment, really. I want to continue to serve the Lord with effectiveness, but increasingly my focus is on, on not how fast we run, but on passing the baton well. Because at the end of the day, if our kids don't serve the Lord, if our kids don't love the Lord, if our grandkids don't love and serve the Lord, and I know some of you came to know the Lord later in life, and that's a tall order, and there's a lot we're praying about. But look back at the verse and see how it happens. That's what it, God is forever. I'm for a moment. I want, I want to leave a legacy. I want to extend what has been done in my life. I want to see my kids loving Jesus and following him. And so let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Not just that God did awesome things yesterday and that's why all of this is here, but that God is going to continue to do awesome things tomorrow and the next day and when we're still gone and our kids are going to be serving and standing in our places on the foundation that God has allowed us to build. I had an awesome moment this week and you know that I'm super thankful to the Lord for my heritage that I have a picture, I've told you this many times, of me and my brother holding uh, my, my grandfather's hand and my great-grandfather's hand while my dad leans in between his father and grandfather, four generations coming out of one church on one Sunday morning. That's as good as it gets. But I don't think about that as much as I used to. Now I think about my sons Two sons and a son-in-law and, and our three kids and their spouses. And I think about our five grandchildren. And I had an awesome moment this week. So Abby, our daughter, pulls into our driveway. And she's got her two, uh, Jaden and Monty, in the back seat. By the way, did you know these kids? Like, these kids are old now. They're like four and five years old. They're still sitting on these extra little seats. What is going on? And, and, and now, so they're sitting up on these extra little seats. And Monty, you know, he just turned four this past week. He's born on my dad's birthday. And so he's got the seatbelt on and everything. And, and I, I walk up by the car. You know, Grandpa wants to say hi. And he hits the remote. And the window comes down. He's like, hey, Grandpa. I'm just like, what on earth? But anyway, I could tell they wanted to tell me something. So they're like, they're like well, you know, and they were kind of fussing. about it. I said, come on, what do you want to tell me? And he just starts like this. He, Monty starts, and his brother joins in. Jaden joins in, and, and he goes... We are Awana Cubbies, we're happy all day long. We know that Jesus loves us, that's why we sing this song. We hop because we're happy and we jump and shout for joy. For Jesus is a friend to us, he loves each girl and... and I lost it, I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm telling you, that, that touched my heart so much. It seems like 10 minutes ago, my kids were singing that song. And now their kids are singing it. And if I get to live as long as my great-grandfather lived, I'll hear my great-grandchildren singing it. And that is what it's all about. Extending the legacy. And God is eternal, and I am not. I'm just here for a minute. And I am going to make sure, God help me, I'm going to make sure that I don't fail to pass the baton. Not for my family, not for my kids, not for my grandkids, not for your family, not for your kids, not for us. Everyone say us. Verse 17 summarizes it all. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Let the foundation be strong. Let the work be solid. Let Christ be lifted up and adored. And let the next generation serve him. Establish it, God. Establish the work of our hands. Yes. 
establish the work of our hands.